Hello. Greetings. We're so glad that you've joined us as we uh, spend more time together in quarantine, uh, seeking to understand more things about uh, what God has made known to us in the scriptures. My name's Ethan. I work with the Venice Church of Christ. We're disciples making disciples in Los Angeles. And again, thank you for the gift of spending time with us. As we begin, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. We're so thankful for all the blessings you've given us, for the life that you've given us in this material creation for you for your son and every spiritual blessing you've given uh, to us in him in the spirit uh, from we understand in the word for one another in christ for the prosperity and health for all the things we even take for granted we're mindful father as we continue to endure the difficulties that exist because of the spread of COVID 19 and the pandemic we pray that you would heal all who are ill that you would comfort, protect, and strengthen all the medical workers, the doctors, nurses, and, and support staff that attend to them, all the essential workers as well. Uh, that you give wisdom and insight to uh, people and to uh, authorities and government to understand the best way forward for all of us. That you would relieve the distress and difficulty of those who are without uh, because of the effects of all that has gone on. As we now spend some time considering things you've made known for us in your word. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds, that we would be receptive to them, that in all things we can glorify and honor you and to abide more thoroughly in you. We are so thankful for all that you've done for us in Jesus, and we look forward to his return. In his name we pray. Amen. In Romans 15 and verse 33, Paul invites that the God of peace be with all of the Roman Christians to whom he is writing. And the predominant message throughout the gospel is the importance and power of peace. And in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11, uh, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he says, Rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Very powerful, comforting, encouraging words that we need to live in peace, that Christians should be peaceable people. And it's good for us to consider why peace is so important, what this peace is supposed to look like, and why peace is such an important and essential aspect to life in righteousness. And let's spend some time looking at what the scriptures have to say about that today. It's not just among Christians that peace is seen as a great thing. In fact, it's considered a desirable attribute even in the world. Uh, as we see, is, peace is described as one of the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And Paul points out that against the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. Uh, there are a lot of people who are anti-war, uh, but do you know a whole lot of people who say that they're against peace? Uh, it would definitely not be very politically correct, at least, to be against peace. But it's good for us to wonder, what kind of peace are most people looking for? If you were to ask people, what does peace look like? What does that mean? Because the kind of peace that most people are looking for is really just an absence of hostility, uh, where you've got uh, people who aren't fighting each other at any given moment, um, a cessation of war. And yet, even though there may be the absence of actual fighting, there's still a lot of disagreement, a lot of enmity, a lot of tension and stress uh, between different groups of people. Uh, people today are very much like a tolerant kind of peace where everybody's tolerating one another. And there's certainly some value to that, don't, don't get me wrong, but is that really peace? Um, for instance, in our, as we're speaking today, uh, theoretically, the United States of America is in a condition of peace with the uh, Republic of Iran or with the uh, uh, Russian Federation. Uh, but would we really say that we have a great relationship with them or that we're really peaceable with them? No. Uh, it just means that we're not in active war against them or against the Chinese or against many other people like that. Um, technically, in the United States, is a con condition of peace within itself, but very few people would actually feel or suggest that we are right now a peaceful or peaceable nation. A lot of people want peace because it's a time to make money and to enjoy uh, various forms of prosperity. Um, although, unfortunately, a lot of money is to be made in war and in the conflicts that are engendered by war. And as long as there's political stability and as long as 
as people can kind of forget about various governmental issues or the idea that bombs are going to be dropped in their house. They feel like they can go about their daily lives and that's peace. But is that really the kind of peace that God is after? Is that what we're really seeing in the New Testament? Because Jesus offers a very paradoxical form of peace, if that's our definition. A paradox uh, is a situation where you have two seemingly contradictory statements uh, that yet are both true. Uh, you can win by losing, or we have to destroy this place in order to save it. A very famous examples of paradoxes, because it would seem that both of those are contradictory, and yet uh, they can be true at the same time. In the scripture, in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, the Messiah would be the Prince of Peace. Um, Luke 179, 1938, John 14, 27, many of the passages, Jesus is said to bring peace. And it's a very powerful idea there that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And yet if you read what he has to say himself in Matthew 10, 34 through 39, also in Luke chapter 12, Jesus declares that he did not come to bring peace to the earth, but a sword. So how can Jesus be the Prince of Peace and yet he expects that he comes and brings a sword. Well, we can't take either one of those in exclusion. We have to understand how these are working together. Uh, and the way that they work together is where is their peace and where is their hostility? And Jesus makes it very clear that the peace that he's talking about uh, is coming to those who put their trust in him, uh, those who are uh, working diligently in his kingdom. In, Luke ch in John chapter 16, and in verse 33, Jesus tells his disciples that all the things he's told them, he has told them that you may have peace in me. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the idea is that the Christians are going to experience tribulation in the world, but they will have peace in him. And this is helping us understand what this paradox is like. Because in Matthew 10, he says, I have come to set uh, a man against uh, his father and brothers against each other, a mother-in-law against a daughter-in-law, and a man's enemies will be members of his own household. Uh, that's not because they are all believers in Jesus. What's happened is that some have become believers in Jesus, and others do not. And those who do not are maintaining this conflict and the hostilities against those who are. And that's because sin is being exposed. That's because uh, the darkness of the world is being made evident in those who remain within it. And it's also helping us understand a little bit about this idea of biblical peace. In Ephesians chapter 2, we have a very powerful uh, concept of what the peace that Jesus brings involves and what it means. Again, as we've mentioned in the world, peace is the uh, absence of active hostility. Uh, it means that people aren't at war with one another. Uh, but when we look at what Paul has to say about what real peace is, we can see that such a definition falls far short of anything God uh, has intended for us. And that really that definition means that there's really no real peace at all. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, we are told that Jesus himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Notice how many times Paul mentions peace there. That Jesus has brought peace, he has proclaimed peace. So what's the peace he's talking about here? The killing of hostility. Not merely the absence of active hostility, but the actual killing of hostility. As long as there is the ground upon which there can be hostility, there can be uh, these these reasons for fighting, there will not be true peace. You've got to eliminate all of those. And that is what Jesus has accomplished through his life and his preeminently in his death. And see, that's the real paradox of peace. What was necessary for our peace to be secured? Jesus had to die. Jesus had to suffer and suffer terribly that he could reconcile the two into one body. Uh, the, the, the core here is the idea that there was a law of Moses and all of that which kept uh, certain people alienated from other people, uh, made a difference between the Jew and the Gentile. 
in Christ, uh, by dying on the cross, he is able to uh, fulfill all such things, that he can now reconcile all people together into one person. That the peace in Christ says that all the ground upon which hostility could arise has been made void. Because in Jesus, what we share in common is greater than anything that can divide us. So in the world at this time, and even to this day, you see divisions based upon ethnicity, upon nationality, upon gender, upon class. And in Christ, all these reasons would be devastated because the idea is that you have in Christ, in the church, men and women, Jewish people and Gentiles, white people and black people, uh, rich and poor, uh, sports fans from one area and sports fans from another area. Um, all of these people can come together. Indeed, even, if I dare say, Democrats and Republicans and can share in one body that what joins them together in their shared faith in Christ is greater than anything that might divide them. But what did it cost for these people to be brought together into Christ. It cost Jesus' terrible suffering on the cross. And this great act of reconciliation, that the ground upon which we were alienated from one another, the sin that separated us from God and one another, is able to be eliminated in Christ. And so the peace that Jesus would give us is reconciliation and relationship with God and one another. It's a way of talking about the relational unity that is embodied in God himself, that God would have with us, and that God expects us to have with one another if we are in him. That's the peace that God is after in Jesus. That is the peace into which we are invited to share. That is a powerful testimony to the world of who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. And so when we see peace in the Bible, this is the kind of peace that's being mentioned. This reconciliation in relationship, this relational unity, because what has brought us together is far greater than anything that would divide us. Which is a very, very powerful, powerful thing. And so the peace that we have with Christ is supposed to be very much internal. And that it has two dimensions. The internal peace that we have between us and God, and the internal peace, i.e. in the church, uh, among the people of God uh, with one another. As we can see in the scriptures, there was no expectation that there was going to be peace in the world. Uh, the idea is in the world there will be tribulation, there will be suffering, there will be the exposure of the darkness that the darkness doesn't want, which would lead to hostility. The preaching of the gospel of peace engenders hostility in the world, not because uh, God is the author of confusion, not because God is the author of hostility or hatred, but because the message of reconciliation with God by necessity exposes all of the darkness that exists in alienation from God and calling out that darkness for what it is and that we need to turn away from it and turn aside from it if we're going to have peace and reconciliation with God and one another, that we need to let go of all of those things that have led us to be alienated from God and alienated from one another. And that's a message that unfortunately far too few really want to hear. That in the end, when you express what true peace is really about, people very much would rather have the world substitute of a cessation from hostilities and a warm, fuzzy, calm feeling deep in your soul as if that is what peace really is about. So let's consider what uh, the implications here of, of, how, of what peace looks like and how this peace works. And so let's start again with that internal peace that we talked about with, with us and God. And this is what Paul is after in Philippians chapter 4. Again, this very powerful message in Philippians 4 and in verse um, 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We, we talk about these concepts very animistically at times. Like, rejoice always. See, we need to rejoice. Look, Paul's in a horrible situation, yet he rejoices in Jesus. Um, don't be anxious. Uh, 
And here, of course, uh, the peace of God will surpa which surpasses understanding will guard and keep you. But that all flows together. One of the things that's always important to remember about righteousness is that you don't get to pick which parts of righteousness you like. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. Uh, one of the things, if I could just wave a wand to change about uh, language, it would be getting rid of fruits of the Spirit. There is no such thing as fruits of the Spirit. In Greek, it is singular. It is the fruit of the Spirit. You don't get these different fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. are not disassociated from one another. If you're going to have true joy, it's because you have peace and you share in love. If you, you cannot rejoice if you don't have the peace or you're not sharing in love. You're not really enjoying and sharing in love if you don't have the peace and the patience. It all works together. And so how do you rejoice in the Lord? When we talk about rejoicing in the Lord, it's not, yay, I'm happy all the time because I just put a smile on my face and grit through it, as much as an internal character disposition that we will recognize that we have this profound relationship with Jesus and that nothing in this creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord from Romans chapter 8 and we draw strength from that and that allows us to confront all the difficulties in which we're going to find ourselves in the world but we rejoice in the Lord we show reason to everyone we recognize the Lord is at hand we are not anxious but we have we 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 make thanksgiving, we let our request be made known to God, and this peace of God, this surpassed understanding, will guard our hearts and minds. What disturbs our inner peace? It's anxiety. Where does anxiety come from? Anxiety is a desire to maintain control in the face of overwhelming circumstances. We human beings want to maintain the pretense that we are strong, that we have control of things, that we're in charge, but yet we live in a creation that is much bigger than us and we are subjected to forces far greater than us. And if we can't necessarily control circumstances, we can at least control our response to circumstances. And that is where we have these anxieties and these worries. And they can be extremely damaging. Uh, when we are driven by anxiety, we uh, very easily fall into fear. We fall into the people who would prey upon that fear to divide us from other people and to be hostile toward other people. A lot of the hatred that you see in the world is really coming down to a, a sense of fear that has generated anxiety. Uh, I'm not sure what their intentions are. They might want to harm me. They might want to do bad things to me. And therefore, I am going to show them the hostility I'm afraid they're going to express to me. Um, it would be remiss not to mention in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic how much of the response that you see is generated by a lot of anxiety about uh, how pervasive the uh, illness is, the effect of the illness, the fact that the illness is affecting all kinds of people. We don't know exactly why some um, barely have any symptoms at all and others are fighting for life on ventilators uh, and many are dying. There's deep anxiety. Now, this is not talking about the fact that other people, there are some forms of anxiety that come from chemical imbalances uh, and from other forms of trauma and things that require a lot of work to get through. This is not an kind of message, just happy up, trust more in Jesus and all the anxiety will go away. But a lot of the anxiety that we hold is not because of those things as much as our desire to try to maintain control. And the whole point of what Paul's saying here, whenever something would come upon you that would lead to anxiety. Uh, we, you need to recognize that in yourself and that if you stop and you pray with thanksgiving to make your quest known to God. Why? Thanksgiving is a reminder of God's covenant loyalty and provision. That God has already provided you great things. Every time we go to the Lord in prayer, I try to insist upon thanksgiving because it puts us in the framework of remembering God has done all these things for us. If God has been so faithful in making the creation, providing abundantly for us, giving us of Jesus, will he not also in Jesus give us all that we need? And when we make our request known to God, we're making our request known to the one who can actually do something about it, the one who actually does have authority and control over everything. Uh, we can worry all day long about ourselves, other people, our situation, and there's not much we can do about it. As Jesus said, can you gain an inch of uh, of your, of your life or an inch of, of actual height based upon worry. No, you can't do anything like that. Worry just consumes you and it doesn't lead to anything productive. But when we turn and let our, pour out our anxieties upon God, 
And that's what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, because God cares for us. Pour out our anxieties. We're not to be ashamed necessarily because we have anxieties. We are very weak creatures in a very a world of forces greater than us. It's very natural to be anxious. We have an outlet for them. We have a channel for them. And when we dedicate ourselves to that, we dedicate ourselves to prayer to God, we can receive the peace that surpasses understanding. The peace that surpasses understanding is grounded in a restored relationship with God, with a relational unity with God. Can it be a sort of infusion of strength from God through the Spirit to have calm in situations where you would not otherwise be calm? I believe so. I believe that God absolutely can give His uh, people peace to endure things that by their own strength they could not endure. That is absolutely part of this promise, that God can, in the midst of all these trials and forms of anxiety, give us peace beyond our understanding. Because there's a whole lot going on in the spiritual realm well beyond our understanding. But all of it is still grounded in the idea that we are restored in our covenant relationship with God. You go through all the promises of the New Testament, and that's what anchors it. If God is for us, who can be against us? When Paul says that he's not being dismissive of the fact that the world is against us, Satan is against us, the powers and principalities are against us, uh, the powers that be can put a lot of pressure on us to adapt to the ways of the world through economic exploitation or economic pressure, through uh, political pressure, through partisan pressures. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons uh, that we w would have to be afraid. The world will never stop giving you reasons for worry, for anxiety, for distress. The world will never stop coming with reasons to divide. But if to us the most important thing is that we are restored in our relationship to God and that in God we will share in life now and forevermore, if we maintain our relationship with God and prioritize and privilege that above all else, that can give us a profound sense of peace to endure anything. But then that gets to the point of what are we supposed to endure? And we recognize that peace is not a promise that everything is going to be great in life. Peace is not a promise even that you will have calmness in life. So many people are really seeking calmness and they call it peace. But there's a very big difference between calmness and peace. Uh, you can have all kinds of challenges in life that you try to deaden through finding some way to calm yourself. Uh, that doesn't change the reality of the situation around you. Um, what God is offering is strength and courage to endure the trials and distress and the difficulties of life. It is not an attempt to minimize or act as if those difficulties do not exist because they most assuredly do. We are called upon though in Colossians 3.15 to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and to be thankful. Think about that for a second. To let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Jesus is to be Lord of our lives. If Jesus is Lord of our life, we need to let his peace rule in our lives. Well, what does it look like for his peace to rule in our life? Well, his peace is the killing of hostility through suffering. And when you look at the whole gospel message, the whole gospel message involves that very idea that we have to go out and that we are going to kill hostility through suffering. That requires us to suffer. So peace is, is not this prospect where everybody's just going to get along, everything's going to be great without any sacrifice. What did it require for all of us to be reconciled to God and to one another in Christ? His brutal, terrible death. The suffering of, of humiliation, degradation, and deep suffering. And how are we going to maintain peace with one another? This picture that Paul has painted in Ephesians chapter 2 about the peace that we have in Christ and the fact that in Christ we all come together from different nations and different classes and different situations in life. It's so beautiful, right? But what keeps it going? What sustains it? The power of God in Christ, the authority of God in Christ, when his people submit to the Lord and are willing to suffer uh, to kill the hostility. Because there's all those things out there that in the world can lead to division. When you have Christians come together of different political persuasions, of different uh, classes, of different experiences, of different nations and ethnicities, what you have going on there is you have all of those possible forms of division just waiting to break out. Just because you all profess the name of Christ doesn't mean those things can't divide. Ephesians chapter 2 is not saying none of these things... Uh, 
uh, are impossible to divide anymore because we're in Christ. Paul himself had experienced that uh, time and time again. His whole ministry is, in fact, involving uh, trying to reconcile these people so that they can actually live and work together in a way that glorifies God. And so all of those things are live issues. All those things that make the body of Christ beautiful in bringing different people together can also tear it apart if those differences get magnified, if people become divisive and factious about it, and if people no longer let the peace of Christ rule in their hearts, but return to anxiety, fear, and the discord of the world. Peace is going to require our suffering. That is why in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than our, yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself with yours in Christ Jesus, talking about all that Christ suffered and, and how that through that he was exalted. Um, we talked about that in terms of joy, we talked about this in terms of love, we talked about this in terms of peace. Because the only way we keep peace with one another is when we sacrifice for one another. When we subject our desires, our way, to the ways of others. Where we don't insist, it has to be my way, uh, I have to be in the right, it has to be according to what makes me comfortable. But when we submit our will to others, when we sacrifice uh, things that we may maintain that unity. Uh, when we are willing to humbly to learn from one another and appreciate the differences uh, and, and the different flavors those differences bring as opposed to allowing the insecurities and the anxieties and fears that can sometimes accompany difference to be magnified. And above all things, that we shut out all those worldly forces around us that exploit division in order to advance their own interests. This is why there is no place for partisan politics among the Lord's people. Because what's, being, what's happening is these forces in the world that are exploiting differences in order to gain power and money uh, are, are being brought in and are tearing the kingdom apart because that loyalty becomes stronger than the loyalty we have in Christ. The same would be true about class loyalty. The same is certainly true in terms of patriotic or national loyalties. Uh, it's true about any kind of loyalties along ethnic or racial lines. Um, all of us must be willing to come together and to sacrifice something, uh, to, to recognize that in Christ it is about humility, it is about the willingness to relinquish power, the willingness to see one another, the willingness to let that peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Did you notice from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the association? Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. We know that the Corinthian Christians have a lot of problems. We know they're a problem church. They've got all these divisions and factions, and they're manifesting all the ugliness of the world. And so Paul sets them straight. Restore yourself to God and one another. Comfort one another. Care for one another. Sacrifice one another. Agree with one another. Actually be together in that sense. To live in peace. Living in peace is not just saying, okay, you know, I'm just going to act like there's nothing really going on here. It is, no, it is sacrifice one another. It is in looking toward the best interests of one another over ourselves. And if we all do that for one another, all of us will be built up. All of us will be made strong. But all of us are going to suffer greatly. We're going to maybe suffer approaches, even for one another, and not have to respond in kind. That we do not alienate just because we have been alienated. That we do not uh, just let hostility foment and, and, and continue, but that we actively work to make peace. That we absorb in ourselves the shame, the humiliation, the anxiety and fear, and bring it upon the God who can bear it, who has borne it all for us in Jesus so that we can be vessels of his love, grace, mercy, and therefore his peace. That's the only way we're going to have reconciliation with one another. That's the only way we're going to have the reconciliation we're supposed to have with the people of God in Christ. That is how we're going to embody the peace of Christ to the world. When the peace of Christ rules in our hearts, not because there is no reason to divide. There's always reasons out there to divide. There's always reasons for problems. There's always reasons for anxiety and fear. But that we are, a, we are taking them in and, and bear, giving those to God 
and that we are not projecting them upon other people, but that we are free to sacrifice for one another as Jesus has sacrificed for us, that we may maintain what is true relational unity in love, which is the whole point of this entire endeavor we have in Christ. And indeed, may we all indeed rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, to let the, love, the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, and we can therefore know the God of love and peace will be with us and the surpassingly beautiful and great peace that goes well beyond anything we can understand that we can have in God in Christ will comfort, strengthen, and sustain us to the end. That is my hope and prayer for myself, hope and prayer for all of you. And we look, we are thankful again that you've joined us again. We hope that you've been benefited by this. If you'd like to talk more about this, please uh, make a comment and we'd love to talk more about it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And may the God of all peace and love uh, strengthen, comfort, and sustain you until we're able to meet again. Thank you.